Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you very much for coming. This is the latest in uh, our series of public lectures hosted by the Conspiracy and Democracy Project, a five-year Leverhulme uh, project that's now in its fifth year. Um, and it's a great pleasure for us to welcome today Dr. Ilya Yablokov, that's right. who works at the University of Leeds, uh, been educated at the Central European University in Hungary, um, and did a PhD in Russian studies at the University of Manchester. He published a number of articles on Russian journalism in the post-Soviet era, and is publishing a book next year. Is that right? Yeah. He's publishing a book in 2018 called Fortress Russia, Conspiracy Theories in the Post-Soviet World. And so he's going to be talking today about Russian media and conspiracy theories. Um, and I hand the floor to Ilya. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. And it's a pleasure to uh, be part of this wonderful project on conspiracy and democracy. Uh, it's, I've been dreaming about giving a picture, a, a presentation here. And here is my chance. So I hope you're going to uh, like my presentation, which basically consists of two major interests I have, major academic interests. One is conspiracy theories, which I have been studying for, for a while. That was my PhD on. And the second uh, topic is Russian journalism and how it evolved after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I merged these two topics and kind of going to present some of my, um, some of the results of my research. And uh, the person you see on the first slide is Dmitry Kiselev, who coined the famous meme in uh, Russian media sphere, coincidence, I don't think so. This is his favorite phrase, which he repeats every time in his weekly show, uh, The News of the Week. And also, he's a very important uh, presenter and the part of the media elite that emerged at uh, the beginning of the 1990s with the collapse in the Soviet Union. He was one of the icons of the liberal media in the 90s. And in the 2000s, he made a wonderful, in a way, dramatic U-turn from being a liberal journalist to being, a, uh, at some point, appallingly conservative uh, presenter and, um, and journalist. So, uh, coincidence, I don't think so. This is, in a way, describes to what extent Russian journalists are keen on using conspiracy theories in their work. Uh, a few words about the methodology I'm using to discuss uh, this issue. First of all, I'm far from um, arguing that uh, conspiracy theories is a tool for crackpots. It's a rather very important uh, element of, of contemporary life, which we need to study in order than to understand uh, what they signify, what do they mean, these conspiracy theories. And here I'm following the um, um, methodological uh, framework suggested by Mark Fenst in his book Conspiracy Theories. Secrets in Power in American Culture, where he suggests that conspiracy theories could be an efficient political strategy to redistribute power and legitimacy between different political actors. This is exactly how I look at uh, Russian journalism, both abroad and uh, at the domestic journalists, how they use conspiracy theories. So conspiracy theories are the populist theory of power. They possess a very important communicative function to and create the people and the enemy, the other, a dangerous other uh, represented by the secretive power block. So if we look at the content which Russian journalists and not even Russian journalists, American journalists uh, produce, we can see that uh, this kind of notion of division of society between the two parts is very popular. I'm very sorry. Alice, could you respond to uh, Sorry. Uh, this is discussing Peter Pomerasm, who is on the way, but he's stuck somewhere in between London and Cambridge. So media and conspiracy theories, what do we know uh, about uh, the usage of journalists, of conspiracy theories by journalists, and how conspiracy theories actually develop in the media sphere. So certainly one of the most uh, important, uh, perhaps, uh, events in the 20th century history is the kind of debate between Joe McCarthy and Edward Murrow when professional journalism, we need to divide between professional journalists and the tabloid journalists, when professional journalist Edward Murrow actually stood up and defended 
politi American political system from conspiracy theories, which became the end of the career of Joe McCarthy. So we can divide between professional journalists, which has certain principles, such as transparent sources, reputation, professional solidarity, evidence-based organs, and professional guidelines, and tabloid journalists, which lacks all these uh, um, important elements. In a way, Michel Foucault and Jack Bratish, who is one of the authors of the book on conspiracy theories and their popularity in the modern world, suggest that um, journalists, professional journalists, are professional gatekeepers who prevent conspiracy theories from, from mainstreaming in, uh, in the media. And the, the idea, the concept of gatekeeping is one of the most popular in the sphere of media studies. Uh, so if a certain journalist or a certain media outlet uses conspiracy theory, at least in the UK, in the US, and in other parts of the world, although we can talk about it in the Q&A session uh, with regard to Donald Trump, because now there is a certain evolution of this, uh, of this um, kind of uh, situation framework. So when a professional journalist uses conspiracy theories in his or her work, he constantly, she constantly falls out of the professional community. That happened with, for example, Gary Webb in the United States in, 19, in the 1990s. Gary Webb, who was a professional journalist, the Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, published a long um, uh, investigation about the CIA crack conspiracy in California, and which was in a way, of that, in, in many ways, a revolutionary work, but it lacked certain very important evidence that allowed other professional media outlets to start the kind of uh, the attack against Gary Webb for spreading conspiracy theories among African American community, among professional, uh, using his status as a professional journalist, spreading it among the kind of ordinary people. And eventually, Gary Webb lost his job, uh, his career was ruined, and uh, eventually he passed away fairly soon. But this case demonstrates that, for example, in the United States, in American media, this, uh, this idea of journalists, professional journalists as gatekeepers works uh, pretty well. But what is going on in the Russian media? So here I'm going to look briefly at Russia Today, RT, another, one of the kind of major icons of um, Russian foreign policy nowadays. And I'm going to look in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to look at the domestic media. So what do we know about Russia today? Uh, called sometimes as Russian Ministry of Information Defense. It all began in, in the mid-2000s as a project to promote Russian interest abroad. And from 2005 to 2008, Russia Today worked as a traditional uh, tool of soft power, talking about Russian culture, Russian nature, Russian people, but it wasn't very uh, uh, popular. Everything changed in 2008 after the war in Georgia, when Russia was criticized for its act actions, military actions in the Caucasus, uh, in Georgia, and Russia today was kind of redeveloped in a very um, kind of aggressive and uh, media outlet, uh, whose aim was basically to undermine uh, the West, the Western elites, uh, the Western governments and the Western media. It all arises from another important development in Russian domestic policies when Vladimir Putin was running for, uh, for the second, at the end of the second presidential term, Vladimir Putin needed a successor and he started, a, like the Kremlin started a, an anti-Western propaganda campaign. So Russia today became kind of part of this uh, major ideological developments in the Russian ideological sphere, where the West was uh, kind of defined as a hypocritical entity, a single hypocritical entity, and uh, uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia led by Vladimir Putin was described as a sole power that is going to resist the West and that is going to attract and other, other countries which are critical of the West of the United States. So this was kind of one of the major pillars of uh, uh, RT's agenda and still is one of the major pillars of RT's agenda because that was one of the ways to uh, place, to situate RT uh, among other media outlets in the US, in Europe, and in general in the world. So, um, as you can see from this, um, uh, from this quotation by Margarita Simonian, uh, kind of the management of RT always wanted uh, RT to be kind of an alternative media to play in the backyard of uh, Western uh, nations, of Western states. 
And in a way, uh, after this uh, major reconfiguration of RT in 2010, RT launched its American Broadcasting. And one of the first long stories which, which was published on its website was 911 reasons why 911 was probably an inside job. A very clever attempt to tap into a very rich culture of conspiracy theories in the United States. Uh, also, I must admit that since uh, 2010, when this broadcasting was launched, a lot of things have changed. So at the beginning of this broadcasting, uh, post-2010, RT launched a number of programs which were speculating and abusing and using different conspiracy theories taken from American conspiracy culture, from, from the conspiracy cultures of European countries, of the United Kingdom. So for example, the program The Truth Seeker, which was uh, closed and which you cannot find on the official uh, YouTube channel was basically full with different conspiracy theories. Also, one of my favorite is Breaking the Set uh, with Abby Martin, which was very anti-elitist, very anti-mainstream media, and was constantly using this um, juxtaposition between the people and the power, which is, uh, which is held by uh, the Western elite or by the Western media. Uh, currently, quite a lot of things change on RT. Now we cannot find so many controversial presenters, so many controversial works. Perhaps one of the few which could be of interest for us is watching the hoax, which is kind of uh, interesting because the two presenters uh, of this program is Tarel Ventura, who is the son of Jess Ventura, another uh, important and famous presenter of conspiracy theories in the United States, and Sean Stone, uh, the son of uh, Oliver Stone, another prominent uh, um, uh, mm, uh, person who is um, constantly spreading and has been spreading conspiracy theories for a good two decades. Uh, so kind of their, their focus on the media is that there is a certain kind of conspiracy of the mainstream media which RT with all the alternative forces has to debunk and destroy. And also after 2010, and that is also quite interesting, RT was the uh, major and very important stage to promote absolutely different conspiracy theories from left to right. So RT was one of the few major, let's put it like that, TV channels who was uh, discussing the Bilderberg conspiracy as something serious, uh, talking about the meeting in the, in, the, in the Bilderberg Hotel, giving the stage to another very important person in the American conspiracy culture, Alex Jones, something which other channels were not uh, really keen on doing. And another way to kind of justify why RT is so keen on conspiracy theories uh, was to demonstrate that there were conspiracies in the past, the conspiracy theories in the past, that turned out to be real. So it is. So the point here, the message was, why are we criticizing Russia today and other alternative speakers when there are so many ideas which were mocked and criticized in the past which turned out to be true? And so this is a very interesting and clever, in a way, move to use conspiracy theories. So in a nutshell, we can say that RT and the project RT uh, is a very interesting and sort of certainly sophisticated tool of Russian soft power, which um, kind of uses conspiracy theories not to promote Russia as it is, but rather to undermine the reputation of Western, of American government, of Western of governments of the Euro European Union, of the United Kingdom, etc., etc. So it's not about promotion, but it's rather about destroying the reputation in, uh, in the line with the methodology suggested by Mark Fest. Now, switching from foreign policy and Russia today to the Russian domestic scene. Uh, what uh, do we have? Well, currently I don't have to um, uh, kind of convince you that the Russian media landscape is uh, rather problematic. Uh, Russian media cannot be called free by any means. It certainly, uh, it certainly has a lot of problems with uh, the freedom of speech. And it was by, by uh, different organizations, uh, Russian media were considered, uh, are considered as unfree. 
so uh, it's a, it's a kind of it's a common place in in the in the historiography of Russian post-Soviet Russian media to suggest that the basic the major turn in in the history of post-Soviet Russian media happened in the 2000s when Vladimir Putin came to power uh, and then after that after the annexation of Crimea in 2012 was there was 2014 I'm sorry uh, there were very few non-state aligned channels free channels that free media outlets that uh, kind of exist and uh, spread um, the different point of view to uh, the uh, state-led media. But also it is uh, important to say that certainly during the 2000s there was a major uh, attack on the freedom of speech in Russia uh, that eventually helped conspiracy theories to become the mainstream in the Russian media. However, how did it happen? What were the main reasons for that? Was Vladimir Putin and his return to the Kremlin the key event in the switch from uh, being free to being unfree to being unethical uh, Russian media? Uh, if you look carefully at uh, the history of post-Soviet media, we certainly um, um, have to note that ethical standards, so those professional guidelines which I discussed at the beginning of this presentation, are a very rare beast in the Russian media. Uh, in the 2000s, indeed, after Vladimir Putin came to the Kremlin, uh, Russian media were gradually turning into the tabloid journalist media outlets. Uh, another uh, kind of important person in this, in this uh, process was the program, the program was well, which was called Programma Maximum, the program Maximum with Gleb Pianik, which was mixing uh, the uh, criminal investigations, tabloid news, celebrity journalism and conspiracy theories. And in a way, we can say that uh, for the media in the 2000s, this switch to tabloid journalism was a very effective way to protect itself, to be kind of uh, efficient from the business uh, point, from the financial point of view, but also kind of lying, to, lying towards the Kremlin, to the, towards the state line, was a very uh, efficient and uh, kind of secured way to uh, um, to, to be um, kind of working and running and also turning into tabloid using conspiracy theories was a, was a very useful political tool for the Kremlin. That's why the Kremlin was attacking the media in the 2000s quite regularly. That's why it was constantly uh, um, appointed uh, loyal oligarchs or loyal companies as owners of the, of the media. Uh, and what are the examples? Uh, so Russian journalists are keen on using conspiracy theories. Why is that? Because Russian journalists uh, are very helpful in the state organized attempts to delegitimize political opponents. One of the key examples in the 2010s, after uh, Vladimir Putin came back to power, to the Kremlin as a president, was the so-called the Pussy Riot affair, which became with the kind of with the scandal around the Orthodox Church when Patriarch Kirill, accused of corruption, uh, uh, said that the church is one of the key elements in the Russian national identity, and the attack on the church is actually attack on the Russian nation statehood. That's why kind of the Russian journalists started to produce different reports about the people, the majority of people, this very visual uh, picture of majority of the people who were very different from businessmen to monks uh, to old people to students. Everyone was represented there. These uh, pictures were kind of a very important way, visual way of explaining that the majority of people in Russia support the Kremlin and support the church. So that was the majority. The minority, the conspiring minority, which was again created by the means of the state-run media, were liberals, were political opposition, were pussy riot themselves, who started this famous punk, uh, punk um, uh, um, event in the church, in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, and who were, according to the elitist Russian journalists, were the thieves column, the spies of the West that tried to destroy Russia from within. So Russian journalists were using different ways of othering uh, the liberal opposition, calling them provocateurs, leeches, 
blasphemers, the vanguard of national traitors, minority of perverts and liberals, and these are all quotation from the from the Russian media reports. And also, also journalists, without following any ethical guidelines, were mixing up massive editing cuts and made up stories to convince viewers that there is a conspiracy against Russia and against Russian people. <laughs> so this is just one of the examples why uh, Russian journalists in the 2000s, 2010s were so kind of had no limitations on. Uh, how to use and abuse information in producing reports. So me and a colleague of mine, Elizabeth Schimfossel from UCL, kind of que uh, started to question ourselves, why exactly, when did it happen? Why Russian journalists have no ethical gui guidelines? Why they are so free and so, in a way, um, um, unrestrained in their usage of um, uh, information. And so we looked back to the 1990s and questioned elitist and rank and file journalists uh, by asking them, so what, what's been happening with, uh, uh, with Russian journalism in, after 1991? So we found out that the basic, the, so the, first, the starting point of the develop, in the development of the ethical principles and guidelines was 1994 when a bunch of uh, Russian elitist journalists uh, wrote, produced the Moscow Charter of Journalists, kind of the first corpus of professional ethics, uh, which basically contained all the necessary elements of professional journalism about the sources, about evidence, about how to double check your sources, how to produce um, um, reports, etc., etc. But there were two problems. First, they did not care about spreading these principles around other, among other professional journalists in Russia. And the second problem was that a lot of these uh, professional journalists were mingling, they were socializing with political elites at that time. So for them, uh, like being friends with politicians was much more important than being uh, ethical journalists, kind of treating this, these newsmakers who were constantly giving them interviews off the record as friends. So, so kind of uh, this inability to spread ethical principles among Russian journalists actually, eventually, that's what I argue, caused the proliferation of unethical reporting and conspiracy theories in the Russian media. Another blow to the Russian professional journalists happened in 1996 when Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russian Federation, was running for elections and his, uh, his um, opponent, Gennady Zyuganov, who represented the Communist Party, was a serious rival. So journalists, together with oligarchs, <coughs> had a combined effort to destroy the reputation of Zyuganov using different ways of mass lynching against Zyuganov. And even those people who signed up this manifest of professional journalists in 1994 took part in this mass lynching campaign against Zyuganov. So the principles, the professional ethical principles of Russian journalism were just uh, thrown away to uh, the window, or I don't know, whatever you call it. And then after 1996, when Boris Yeltsin won the elections and ran for the second presidential term, the oligarch, this infamous name it's, that is in a way one of the icons of post-Soviet Russia, they basically took all the major uh, media outlets. And uh, what happened in the 1990s and then eventually in the 2000s, they were dictating to journalists what they have to do and that what they should not do. And that had a major blowback in the 2000s when the state started to get the control over independent media or over the media owned by the oligarch. The same process happened in the state-run media. So, in the 1990s, the oligarchs were telling the journalists what they should do and what they should not do, how they should cover events, how they should bash their opponents of a certain oligarch. In the 2000s, the state, the deputy minister of mass communication said that to the, the students of journalism uh, de, uh, department in Moscow State University, you've got to do what the owner says. And at the same time, Dmitry Kiselyov, who was on the first slide, says when he, come, when he came to uh, the new position at Russia Today, he said, well, you can have other opinions, but if your opinion is going to be different to the opinion of the state, you're going to lose your job. So the message was pretty clear. And this message originates from the 1990s. 
So what we have as a result and how can we understand the, the importance of professional ethics in the spread of conspiracy theories in, in post-Soviet Russia. First of all, I have to draw your attention to the phrase which I treat as the mantra of post-Soviet Russian journalism. That was uh, uh, that what I heard in a couple of interviews I met with uh, rank and file journalists. We won't let the facts spoil a good story. I think it's, it is very kind of uh, revealing on how Russian journalists are working with the facts. Well, first of all, due to increasing political control in the 2000s, the tabloid journalism becomes the mainstream of Russian media. So all the lack of principles is, in a way, becomes the principles of operation in the Russian media. Again, as I said, open pressure and uh, censorship is not uh, very important. It's not that noticeable in Russia. On the other hand, it's not the open pressure, it's not the open censorship, which is popular in the Russian media, but self-censorship. But most importantly, not the self-censorship in itself, Russian media and Russian journalists developed a very interesting professional skill, which can be called uh, self-censorship, but it is not criticized by the journalists. On the contrary, Russian journalists who produce this report, it doesn't matter whether it's a, pre it's, it's a printed press, it's an online uh, media outlet, it's a television, they all say that you need to have the so-called, in Russian it's a, it's a word adequateness. Uh, it is, it's not adequacy uh, it, because it's, it's going to be a wrong translation. But it's rather the sixth sense. So journalists sense what to do and what not to do, how to cover the story so it would actually entertain the viewer and will also toe the line of the state media or of the owner in that sense. So they learn how to be, journalists learn how to be original and how to be individual, how not to be boring because then the viewers are going to stop watching the TV or read the newspaper or read the new website. And then media and the owner will eventually lose profits that, that are generated by, uh, by advertisement. So I think it's very important when you, we asked all the, quite a lot of media managers and rank and file journalists about how they treat professional ethics and what is the place of, uh, say, guidelines or professional solidarity in their life. There is no solidarity. There are no professional principles. There are no guidelines because the guidelines are for those who want to have a very clear message sent to their viewers or readers. Not having guidelines is actually much safer for Russian journalists because it will help them and the media managers, no matter whether it's a state-run, state-owned media or a private media owned by the oligarch, it, it actually helps them survive in the very murky, very shadowy media climate of post-Soviet uh, media environment. So even there are some exceptions. There are a couple of uh, media, uh, for example, Vietnamese, which was established at the end of the 1990s, or Medusa, which was established uh, in the mid-2010, which are following certain guidelines. They have written guidelines, and they are very different from uh, the overwhelming majority of media. But they are the minority. And, uh, uh, for example, in, there is another important um, uh, media outlet in post-Soviet Russia, uh, which is liberal, which is in opposition to the government, which criticizes the government and the regime quite often. But what is very interesting, what was revealed in our uh, research, journalists and media management of this oppositional newspaper, oppositional media outlet, also almost doesn't have professional guidelines, professional principle, according to work. It has a specific um, type of professional principles. So these are the two quotations which, um, which came from, uh, from uh, the interview with Dmitry Muratov. And I think they are kind of very revealing, especially when I'm going to talk about the last case, which shows that even the oppositional, even the professional media outlets, which are quite popular in Russia, especially among the people who are critical <coughs> of the Kremlin, the problem of not having professional guidelines and professional principles also causes controversies that involve conspiracy theories. So last year, uh, exactly one year ago, Nova Gazeta, the new newspaper, this, this outlet, published an article which is called The Groups of Death, which in, in, in a nutshell was uh, discussing 
the emergence and existence of more than 1,000 communities on Russian social network Vkontakte, which is a copy of Facebook, uh, that are waging the war against the Russian youth. Basically, they are kind of, they created the owners, the uh, founders of the social groups. They are certain puppet masters, according to the author of this article. That word, the author of this article, Galina Mursaleva, put on uh, at, the, at the beginning of her um, article. Somebody is systematically and consistently working with young people on social networks, pushing them over the edge meaning killing them because youth young people are playing certain virtual games in this on the social networks and at the end of this game these youngsters have to commit a suicide uh, there are no there is no evidence in this article the article is written in a very emotional way and what is more important at the opening remarks the editorial remarks uh, they say that this is the open call to the law enforcement services to, um, to take certain measures to close these groups and put those responsible for the death of the youth into a jail. So currently the, the article was read, at least it was visited, this web page was visited by 2 million viewers. It's a pretty good number. Uh, later the author published a book again with the same argument and uh, basically he, uh, this article certainly had a certain outcome, which I'm going to discuss later. So inside of this article, you can find a scheme which the editorial wrote, the author produced. This scheme describes the plan of uh, suicides of uh, youngsters across the Russian Federation. There is no evidence again. Uh, the author does not really bother to explain how she got to that. It's the, it just said that we used some open sources and we consulted the law enforcement services in order to find out how uh, these puppet masters are killing our teens. And uh, in a way, uh, this very conspiratorial nature of the article in Nova Gazeta demonstrates that even professional journalists such as Nova Gazeta can fall into the trap of conspiratorial uh, uh, myth creation. But what is ironic or in a way dramatic is that the article in Nova Gazeta, published by a professional media outlet, which has a reputation, caused a new round of television coverage on the state-aligned media channels that demonstrate that the internet and social networks are part of the information war against Russia, against Russian youth, and against Russian parents. So all the major TV channels produce TV shows which had basically one simple idea. There is an information war, there is a conspiracy against Russian people which tries to destroy Russia from within, to destroy its future. A controversial uh, politician and deputy of the state, Duma, Vitaly Milonov said that it's a, kind of, it's a new kind of information war which has to be stopped. Maybe it's Ukrainian hackers who are meddling in the, in the Russian social networks. So as a result of it, uh, there was a there was a debate debate on social media with uh, among the journalists of Nova Gazeta and other media outlets and the uh, journalists, for example, of Medusa, who uh, published their own vision of this article, their own criticism, and they tried to kind of check and criticize this article on the basis of poli of professional principles. What is the evidence? Uh, who is your authority? Who uh, provided you with advice on what is what is the internet? What is the nature of social networks? And all the boxes they ticked all the boxes, and it turned out that Nova Gazeta basically failed to see uh, to produce a, a balanced and the convincing report. As a result of this debate, the journalists of Nova Gazeta and of other certain some somewhat me liberal outlets said but who appointed you the journalists of Medusa as gatekeepers who says that you are defining what the professional principle of reporting is we reported on a very important topic and we think that it has to be uh, there should be certain me measures taken so here we see that the lack of principles which the principles which were which failed to be established in the 1990s now demonstrate that even professional media are failing 
to report um, um, a kind of a balanced reports, but also they, they produce conspiracy panics. So what's the outcome of this case and what's the outcome of this process of um, kind of of this small research? So the newspaper with the reputation triggered the conspiracy panics. It uh, demonstrated that there are certain puppet masters, right? The result of it is, in a way, very simple. On the one hand, we see that there are no professional principles in Russia. There, there are some media outlets which try to follow it, but it's just a tiny minority. But the majority is not following. But most importantly, the reputation of this new newspaper uh, triggered the amendments in the state legislation, which caused uh, further uh, shrinking of freedom on the internet and also it, uh, now it is uh, kind of the penalty for the suicide incitement online is much much harsher and what is also most important is that Vladimir Putin himself kind of uh, intervened in this discussion and said that he approves these amendments that touch uh, our children, children of the Russian Federation that could be the victims of some um, unknown puppet masters and in a way, that goes along the lines of a famous uh, Vladimir Putin statement about the CIA invented the internet. And that's why it has to be uh, heavily controlled in Russia, because it could be one of the ways to wage the information war against the Russian Federation. So in conclusion, we can say that conspiracy theories uh, used by Russian media uh, professionals and journalists in various ways. In, in RT, it's, it's a very open and in a way sophisticated strategy of undermining reputation of foreign, uh, of foreign NGOs or foreign governments. Uh, but domestically, it's a very important tool for the Kremlin to relocate, to destroy reputation of oppositional leaders, to destroy the, rep the uh, reputation of other media outlets, and basically to make sure that the messages and the policies um, uh, developed by the Kremlin will have a support in the state. Uh, so I would say that kind of um, uh, the uh, conclusion could be that Russian media and Russian journalists, due to the fact that there is a lack of professional principles, will carry on producing and abusing conspiracy theories uh, in the media. But then there is a room for hope because uh, still there is a minority of journalists who wants to report, who wants to follow the guidelines, who still respect a certain principles. And so I'm trying to be uh, positive in that sense. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Now, we were supposed to have um, Peter Pomerantz here, but he has been detained by circumstances, I should have stressed. <laughs> Nothing more than that. Detained? Oh, and um, in his place, we have me. John. <laughs> in place. John, I'm a PhD student here at the of Slavonic Studies. I work on media in uh, Eastern Ukraine, which is uh, two sort of semi independent um, conflicts. Uh, Neely asked me if I, in case Pomerantz could make it. To replace him, I don't think I will. At least not. Um, I won't be nearly as entertaining as this morning. Don't be so but, shy. Nonetheless, uh, thank you so much for your talk, Ilya. Uh, I think it was extremely interesting. Um, I listened to it with great interest, and probably going to use some of it for myself as well for my research. I think um, one of the questions that I had while listening to your talk is, um, how would you distinguish a conspiracy theory from a regular theory, from something that is worth? with you, let's say, proper journalistic publication. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, conspiracy theory has, I should have started with that, with the with the, a little bit of methodology, but then I thought since I'm on a conspiracy and democracy project, it's going to be, a, I'm gonna steal the time from, from the kind of the core of my research. So conspiracy theory and uh, kind of uh, always have certain um, key elements. First of all, there's a, there's a, a secret group uh, of creatures or human beings creatures because we can talk about the lizards, right? Alien lizards who kind of control the global elites. Uh, also, this, is, uh, this group always has a secret plan, right? So that's why it's called conspiracy, it's always secret. This plan is always carried out uh, in a perfect, it, it has a perfect design in a way. So whatever this group plans always kind of uh, reaches its goal. 
And uh, what is another element is that this group is always kind of uh, trying to get more power, although it is still quite powerful uh, and has a capability of kind of carrying on, like developing this perfectly designed plan, it still gets more and more power. So kind of th this, is a, this is the necessary elements of conspiracy theory. So that's how kind of you can distinguish uh, this phenomena in, the, uh, in, the, in your readings, for example, in the literature or in the media. Sure. And um, I think I'll do one, one or two more questions before I guess I open the floor to, to everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, one is about the, the effects. So you say Russia today, for example, is very active in the United States peddling, let's say, conspiracy theories. Which, mm -hmm. um, for example, right now has developed this whole like investigation inside the US with, with like, yeah. Russian involvement in the elections and all that sort of stuff. So it seems to have a lot of effect. But what could you say about how much of what Russia today mm -hmm says people actually believe in the United States, let's say? Uh, well, it's very hard. Every time uh, we discuss Russia today, it's really hard to say uh, who watches it, who's the audience of these programs, right? Because so far, there is not a single research made on who watches RT, who consumes its messages, who believes in that kind of st in their stories. So it's really hard to say like what kind of effects it has. What we can say, and what I've noticed at least uh, when I was studying RT for the last five or six years, uh, it was very, very um, flexible in terms of how, what stories to pick uh, and what audience <coughs> to choose in terms of, for example, there was some conspiracy theories which were addressing to the far right, for example, and at the same time, in the next problem, there could be another discussion which would be addressing the audience which shares far left or left ideologies, left views in a way. So in that sense, RT was a very, uh, and is a very kind of a clever um, instrument of kind of addressing different audiences, different messages. Uh, but there was some overarching argument in that. No matter, and I've actually I had a few kind of informal conversations with the journalists who had been working at RT in the newsroom, and they kind of they confirmed my hypothesis. Certainly, I cannot really, uh, um, 400 percent. I, I don't want to kind of be unethical in that sense, academically unethical. But like they confirmed that kind of the main idea is whatever uh, news come up that can be twisted in. Uh, the critical way towards, for example, the United States government or UK government, it's going to work. Whatever works, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then we can see that, for example, conspiracy theories which we have been using in uh, Breaking the Set, in Abby Martin's uh, program, there were some stories which are quite genuine, right? Which were quite, for example, American involvement in Afghanistan, right? The, the problems with the kind of uh, with dealing with the Mujahideen there and with the problems with democratic development of Afghanistan, uh, even though there was, there was so much uh, said about uh, the role of America in develop democratic development of Afghanistan. So then Abby Martin kind of puts on the top <laughs> of, this, uh, of this fact, basically, of failing democratization of Afghanistan, she puts another story of uh, CIA crack conspiracy and kind of relates it to uh, the uh, drug trafficking from Afghanistan to Europe and to the US. And so it's kind of, it all merged together. It has a very mixed signal. So she is not really honestly following the kind of professional principles, but she reaches, thus she reaches the, the goal. She kind of, she says, well, there is a conspiracy. There is an American government that, which involved in conspiracy against people, not only in the United States, but all over the world, because its um, army basically supports drug trafficking. You cannot check it, right? You cannot prove that she doesn't have any evidence. But whoever wants to be critical, who wo whoever wants to have this evidence of bad American policies, going to get this uh, message, going to consume that message. And in a way you mix uncontroversial things with very controversial yeah. things so that even the controversial yeah. things look, well, the one thing must be true, so the next thing might be true as well. Yeah, and that. also there was another, for example, going, going back to this report on drug trafficking from Afghanistan, which I used in my article on RT. Actually, there was another story. She <laughs> used Gavin Webb and the way how professional journalists destroyed his reputation as saying, look, we are alternative media. 
if you want to destroy our reputation in the same way you destroyed Gary Up, you're not going to, to make it. Because Gary Up eventually was right, because the CIA kind of confirmed, <coughs> it doesn't really, didn't really confirm, but it said that there were some reports on the CIA agents who were aware of this drug trafficking. So it wasn't really like it's very shady. It's very kind of uh, unclear. But this, uh, but this is precisely the climate in which uh, RT operates, and this is precisely why there is so much hype around RT and how efficient it could be uh, uh, on the global stage. For example, in the United States elections. Okay. Well, can we have questions to the floor? Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, Russia today tends to pick up anyone who expresses strong opposition to the existing system or the existing government. So, George Galloway, for example, has a regular program on, on, on Russia Today TV. And uh, when I had my very public spat with Michael Gove in 2013, when he was um, the Secretary of State for Education about the history curriculum, Russia Today were right there asking me to appear on, on, uh -huh. on their program. And I, look, I checked it out and said, no, thank you very much. But they, they will do that. They sort of pick up any kind of, anything that, that, that opposes the existing government in a, in a radical way. Um, but actually what I wanted to say was that there's surely a lot of continuity here. Um, if you go back to Stalin's rule in the 1930s or post-Stalinist Russia, uh, communist countries like East Germany, which I, I knew know quite well, um, you will find these conspiracy theories are constantly there. Mm -hmm. So Stalin, of course, constant conspiracies by Trotskyites, wreckers, saboteurs, and yeah. so on, uh, used as a kind of technique of, of, of rule. And again, in, in uh, late Stalinist and early post-Stalinist Russia, the same kind of mirror image almost of McCarthyism, uh -huh. uh, any kind of, kind of, of deviance or criticism was uh, met by accusations of being part of a Western conspiracy, or later on uh, as uh, evidence of insanity. There was a whole series of oppositional figures who were put into mental hospitals because that only an insane person could, mm -hmm. could oppose the system. Mm -hmm. So really, it seems to me that there's a culture of media control and conspiracy theories and a kind of defensive manipulation of the news, mm -hmm. which has been there for a very, very long time. And this is really uh, a kind of continuity rather than anything new. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, actually, on the side note, I also had an invitation from George Galloway. Uh, I had email last year, and I was invited to talk about the Western threat to Russia and the, the NATO and the threat it poses to Russian Federation. It was quite uh, ironic and funny because I guess producers did not check what I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, I agree with you. Uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union and in post Soviet Russia, as the successor state, um, and I mean, in a way, the culture which was inherited from the Soviet times, especially the journalistic culture, uh, there was no room for professional principles. And propaganda was part of profession in a way. <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, there was a, the, in the university there was a, so the word propaganda did not have a negative connotation. That's mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, the interesting and kind of uh, the curious thing is that the attempt, which was made both by this elitist journalist in an, at the beginning of 1990s, was so much different from what their colleagues were doing in 1992, 1993, and this. And actually, what triggered them to write down the principles of profession was their previous experience of working in Western media outlets. AFP, CNN, Norwegian uh, media, uh, BBC, etc., etc. So they actually were uh, familiar with the basic principles. And they the authors of this uh, Moscow Charter of Journalists, they actually went through the, all these guidebooks which were taken from the BBC, from Norwegian media, from American media, to write down what is common between these uh, media outlets. <coughs> and so they had this attempt, and they actually, some of them tried to follow it. Some of them still try to follow it. But the failure to kind of to promote these principles among, the, uh, among their colleagues 
uh, because when I was asking them why didn't you try to spread the word uh, among say people in as journalists in St. Petersburg in the regions they were saying well basically we were, we were taking care of our own uh, careers we were more interested in making money because Russia in the, at the beginning of the 1990s was a, was a pretty um, terrible place in terms of financial stability so they had to work a lot in order to make money. And journalism never brings a lot of cash, right? Even, even if you're a elitist journalist, that, it doesn't mean that you're a millionaire. And so they basically, they opted for their own careers instead of uh, kind of trying to battle with the Soviet principles of, prof of the journalistic profession. And that was, unfortunately, that the tragic failure which we can uh, witness today. Yeah, um, I want to go back, well, thank you for the presentation. I want to go back to the question, and the very first question on the on, on, on your criteria of, of uh, <coughs> conspiracy, of defining something as conspiracy theory as opposed to theory or whatever. I mean, because everything you mentioned, basically, uh, as your criteria, including like control of global elites mm -hmm. and blah, 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 no, it's all basically um, explicitly almost. Uh, most of them are replicated in the works of such people as, for example, William Donkins, who rules America, which is a basic text in sociology, fashion here in Cambridge, for example, or uh, Noam Chomsky, the likes of Noam Chomsky, or the likes of Foucault, for example, right? And and all of these people, I mean, all of these people are basic. I mean, they serve as a basic text for 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 university courses, at least if not in the United States, but at least in in the likes of the United Kingdom, France, or whatever. And most of them, most of the time, they produce very explicit evidence, actually, for, for, for the same kind of narratives used in what you call the theory, right? Mm -hmm. So having said that, uh, and, uh, having said that uh, in the United States, if you talk to people, most of them will be denounced, despite the evidence they produce, based on you know, the, the argument that they are like far left or whatever, uh, despite the arguments and the evidence that they and despite the evidence that they produce for the argument. So I mean, having said that, uh, don't you think that uh, the, the notion of conspiracy theory is just a Western way to denounce whatever narrative they don't like? Just as you say, the likes of Putin would denounce, would use something else to denounce uh, whatever in the Western narrative they don't like. Uh, I'm not quite getting who, who Western way of denouncing. I'm not. I mean, I'm saying basically that whatever criteria you use to define yeah. and differentiate. Uh, the theory mm -hmm. does not work because in the in what we call like social sciences, mm -hmm. hardcore science or whatever, they use the same kind of narratives and they back up back it up with evidence. Sure. And we don't call it yeah. uh, conspiracy theories just because they've been written by someone like Foucault who is recognized that you mm -hmm. know uh, also whatever, right? Uh, but if that is used by a Russian journalist, for yeah. example, supported by something mm -hmm. someone like Putin mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. government behind him, we will denounce it as conspiracy because it yeah, goes against the Western narrative. Yeah, I see. Or well, uh, I mean, Noam Chomsky is quite often considered as a conspiracy theorist. That's well, the guy cites evidence. I mean, I had a conversation with, for example, someone from Carnegie Endowment last mm -hmm. year uh, mm -hmm. uh, about the U.S. policies in the Middle East and mm -hmm. Latin America, whatever, mm -hmm. about how they basically topple mm -hmm. down the government they don't like, despite even though yeah, you know, they might have been elected democrat, whatever, like in Palestine, for example, mm -hmm. Hamas. Uh, and I would refer, when I refer to Noam Chomsky, to you know, saying that it's not only me and whatever, if they are actually people, scholars writing it. So the guy said, well, he's just far left, nobody listens to him. Mm -hmm. uh, to which I said, it doesn't really matter really whether he's far left or far right, because he actually cites historical evidence and facts to support it. But that was not important, because they would just denounce him, uh, you know, as far left, just to, you know, just to stick with his own mind. Right, so it's not about Noam Chomsky, you know, you might call him as conspiracy theorist, but the guy is no, I mean, he, if he offers a fact to support his argument, what, what is there that would make him a conspiracy theorist as opposed to a scholar? But what, is, what is important is that I think, uh, I mean, we can have a discussion about that, certainly. But what is important is that when I'm saying uh, conspiracy theorist, or a conspiracy theorist, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Uh, the approach suggested by our colleagues from the United States is that it's, it's a very important way of seeing uh, social phenomena. And if a certain idea has like conspiratorial uh, elements in it, 
that's the way for us as scholars to look at what this idea is pointing at. Maybe it's a very, let's say, Peter Nye's idea of um, it's a quick fix to a, a rapidly changing uh, a kind of social environment, if I'm quoting it right, and Andrew. Uh, yeah? <laughs> so um, uh, it, it's, it's very important to say that conspiracy theory is not something negative, not certain well, things. In your report, it was all. But this is, this is another thing. Uh, I'm using it, I'm looking at that. The idea was to show that why Russian journalists are keen on conspiracy theories, why they are producing them, and how what we can learn about Russian media, Russian society, Russian politics through studying these ideas, right? For, so for example, from the failed, the failed to explain the failed path of democratization of Russia after 1991, for example, right? And so, uh, if you're looking at, at other, oh, for example, examples in the Pussy Riot case, the why Russian uh, journalists and Russian kind of Russian political elites were so keen on exploiting conspiracy theories about the West is that they are just they fail to, for example, um, uh, explain what the Russian identity is, right? And that's why they are kind of opting, for example, for the orthodox uh, majority of people who are kind of orthodox by religion, and that's how we define the Russian person, a <coughs> loyal to the state. But then switch to another one. So we, for, for me, for example, as a scholar, this is a very important way of understanding. Well, that's that there is a problem, for example, in nation building in post-Soviet Russia. Why that? And and through these theories, I can sort of understand and know something. Can I just come in there? I mean, well, you're kind of tying yourself up in knots here because right through, it's quite clear, I think, to everybody that you're using conspiracy theory in an absolutely negative term. So I'm really surprised to hear you saying you weren't. Um, uh, but what you what you were saying was that these conspiracy theories have no evidence because journalistic standards have gone out of the window. So they don't do fact checking. They don't. They're not interested in facts. They manufacture factoids or pseudo facts. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered in uh, in, in uh, nearly five years now of, of the project is that conspiracy theorists often I mean they make a point of piling up things that look like facts. You might call them factoids or pseudo facts, um, which at first sight seem quite plausible. They join up the dots, as it were, the dots being facts in in novel and interesting ways. So if you take the conspiracy theory that Hitler and Eva Brown escaped from the bunker in 1945 uh, and went to live in Argentina and had two children, uh, there's an eight-part TV series uh, about this called Hunting Hitler. There are several books about this. And they relentlessly pile up things that look like facts. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do, and this applies to Chomsky and anyone else, uh, whatever they're saying, you have to look extremely critically at these. You can't just say they're facts. You have to look behind them. And when you start in the, the theory that I've just mentioned, when you start looking at them, it'll always be uh, third or fourth hand. You know, oh, my grandmother knew somebody who's seen Hitler in Argentina. You know. Uh, my, my, my girlfriend's uh, father's brother met the children and so on, and you start looking for the children because they're not there, nobody finds them, but somebody's heard of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very similar in when you have a lot of conspiracy theories. If you take McCarthyism, the classic conspiracy theory, uh, the whole uh, House Un American uh, uh, Activities Committee uh, depended on investigations which identified people. Mm -hmm. as, as communists, but there's a whole load of kind of missing bits in the middle, even if they were, if they had been communists. So I, I think we have to be very, very clear that, that it's not just spinning theories in the air mm -hmm. without any factual basis. Most commonly, conspiracy theories involve uh, trying to build up an impression of facts on the most kind of crudely empiricist basis. Yeah, well, David, it's okay. Thank so, you. okay, go there and then. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for a very interesting and truly fascinating talk. My name is Maria, I'm a PhD student here, and I was educated as a journalist uh, in Ukraine originally, and I do remember that. Uh, when I was 17 and the first year student in journalism in Ukraine, my very first exam was in journalist standard and journalism ethics. I was scared to death by that. And uh, I'm wondering if, um, if in Ru do, do you know whether in Russia 
young journalist students are just not taught journalist standards at all? Or is it more like when they get their first jobs, they start to forget about everything you ever learned in a, in university that doesn't work this way? And the second question is, you started your presentation with uh, a citation of Kisilo saying that mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to go against the state, you're mm -hmm. going to lose your job. And I'm also wondering to what extent is this a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way? To what extent state actually controls all the journalists through state media, through oligarchs? Or is it more about self-censorship of journalists who think that they will lose their job if they try to go against the state? Mm -hmm. So how, for how the state, mm -hmm. is the state yeah. actually enforcing yeah, yeah. this? Mm -hmm. Uh, about this first question, uh, in the first year in all major schools of journalism across Russia there is a module which lasts for one year which is called Ethical Standards. Uh, there is a problem though that for example the, some of the journalists which I talked to which, who graduated in the 1990s they were saying that the, this module was taught by the professors who taught this module back in the 1970s, 1980s, which addresses us directly to the previous discussion of the, of the Soviet impact of the, um, uh, on the Soviet impact of, on journalism. Uh, nowadays, and I recently had an interview with uh, the dean of the uh, School of Journalism in Tomsk for another project of mine, and uh, when I asked him about this module, he said, yeah, 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 we certainly teach our students ethical standards for the whole year, and then Unfortunately, when they go to newsrooms during the summer break and work as journalists there, they face one very clear dilemma. Uh, you can follow ethical principles, but then you're not going to get the job. Because eventually, you will be told by the manager, by the line manager, how to cover such and such story. So even if they try their best, I mean professors in the schools of journalism, how to cover the story, the reality will still be biting. And to what extent the state controls the journalism? That's a, that's a very uh, interesting question because on the one hand, it is, it is quite clear that the impact of the state is, 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 is incredible. And uh, what has been done by various means by the Kremlin starting from late 1990s and especially in 2000s was the kind of creeping authoritarianization of the, of, the, of the media environment. So oligarchs were put under control, uh, the state media, those state media who were spreading decent voices were either shut down, some were relocated, some rel like Medusa for example, they relocated to Riga. Uh, and uh, various other things were happening with the, with the Russian media outlets. But then, when you speak to the like to real journalists who work in newsrooms, uh, they are going to say, "What well, nobody tells us what to do." Uh, we have meetings with our line managers. They kind of they assign tasks to us, but exactly we know what to do because we have this very important skill of how to sense adequateness how to sense what to report or what not to report. So, and when we ask, so do you have any calls, for example, from the governor, if we're talking about the regional media? Uh, most probably they're going to say, well, we have like our owners or our media management have certain meetings with the, with the representatives of administration. M federal channels also have like major media outlets have meetings with the representative of the, of the Kremlin. But it's kind of a, uh, they assign like certain Ideas. So what has to be covered here, what kind of topics will, should be covered in the next coming weeks, etc. But on a day-to-day -day, um, kind of um, basis, there is no direct pressure, as far as I know. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I kind of feel tempted to just chime in with that conversation that was occurring in the first row there, because um, uh, Domhoff, who you mentioned, uh, Chomsky and, uh, and Foucault, if you actually, I mean, all of them uh, say we're not doing conspiracy theory. Uh, and so they recognize that there is some kind of thing out there distinct to the kind of critique of society which they engage in. Um, and so, I mean, if you have a look at Chomsky, for example, in his, uh, 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 his engagement with the 9-11 crowd, uh, he is definitely saying, I'm putting forward 
a kind of like explanation. I, I'm putting forward a critique of American imperialism and whatnot, but it is certainly very different to the conspiracy theories which are which are being produced by the 9/11 crowd. And so I just wanted to kind of simply point that out just to say that. Yeah, yeah, but the point was that what they produce eventually is very, very, very similar to what right, okay, was yeah. called, right, and and then I asked what was the criteria to distinguish. Right, that. exactly, and it's a really good question because I think yeah, we are still in some ways still grappling with that. I mean, you could say um, one thing is the kind of like the counter narrative, <coughs> so this is where it's kind of coming up to a kind of a question, um, but that a conspiracy theory is often. Uh, simply a counter narrative, a narrative, a narrative that goes against the official version, which of course, though, is kind of what Chomsky is also pushing for. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you've put your finger on a kind of like an important issue, but they are adamant themselves that it's not conspiracy theory. Of course, because they're afraid that everybody would denounce them by saying that what you say is conspiracy, so they have to say that this is not a conspiracy theory. Right, but they, yeah. And then you have to address the issue of why. Why this one is a conspiracy and that one is not. Okay, so if it's not the counter narrative, uh, and this is what I want to get to work, working up to my question, uh, when it comes to the Russian situation, uh, I mean, if we say that uh, conspiracy theory is one of the uh, one of the characteristics, not the only characteristic, but one of the characteristics is that they are a counter narrative within our media environment. What is their? I, I often wonder is what their status will be within the Russian situation. I mean, are these kind of like, uh, they're no longer counter-narratives, I guess. Um, though on some level, I wonder how true that actually is, whether they are still being put out as counter-narratives to not, the, not opposing the Russian regime, but opposing the narrative which is out there in the West. Like, do they still take their kind of status as being different to the mainline, mainstream narrative that is to be found in the Western media. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. a, uh, I don't know if you have anything to say about how you would actually characterize these conspiracy theories circulating within Russian media in terms of whether they are the official version or whether they are the counter narrative. Because it's simple in the West, for the most part, it has been simple in the West, perhaps it's becoming a little bit more difficult in these times. Mm -hmm. But it becomes complicated mm -hmm. in a situation such as, uh, such as Russia. And yeah, well, the, the, that, that's the interesting uh, thing about Russian conspiracy culture because uh, if you take the case of the United States, for example, the, 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 the mostly the explored one, right? So we see that, like, why, why conspiracy theories are called counter narrative because they are produced by, well, for example, by people like Alex Jones, right? Who is not the representative of political elite or financial elite, and he challenges their point of view, which uh, kind of for kind of, which is supported, let's put it like that, by the media outlets such as New York Times, Washington Post, those who have reputation, right? Or for by uh, know, respectful uh, academics, for example. That's why it's called kind of the uh, challenge in this narrative is called counter narrative. In the Russian case, pretty much similar was taking place in the 1990s. Uh, when the conspiracy theories were produced by the people who were not part of the elite. For example, a very kind of uh, um, significant case is Alexander Dugin, who is quoted and who is mentioned everywhere. He, in the 1990s, he was, uh, uh, I wouldn't call him a marginal thinker, but he, was, uh, uh, he wasn't in the mainstream. But he was constantly trying to get into political mainstream. He was constantly trying to become a part of the political elite, and eventually he became a part of the of the elite. The question is uh, whether mm, the the discord has changed in Russia. The political discord has changed that, which kind of uh, put Dugin into the center of it and turned him from a marginal counter uh, producer of the counter narrative into producer of mainstream narrative. Or it was um, some other factors, like something in some other process. So in the 1990s, we can we can uh, say that conspiracy theories were a counter narrative to the, uh, for example, to the events, to the political events, or to the events in social economical environment, right? When uh, uh, deputies in the state Duma were constantly uh, accusing the financial and uh, political elites in undermining the Russia, destroying, like waging the genocide war against the Russian population, but that what happened in 1998-1999. But then if you look at, the, let's say, 2014 and the emergence and the start of the, of the Ukrainian crisis, 
we can see that the, these, the conspiratorial narratives, which used like some 15 years ago, which were counter narratives, became what the mainstream politicians started to use constantly. For example, by justifying the reasons of annexation of Korea, Crimea, or by that Vladimir Putin who mentions, and I must say that Vladimir Putin uh, cannot be called like a conspiracy theorist in himself. He's very cautious of not using, not abusing these narratives. Of he uses them at very carefully and very rarely, and and in very critical moments of kind of, of political history. If you look in hindsight, uh, so when let's say Vladimir Putin says that CIA is the uh, invented the internet and that the internet is a tool of information war against Russia, and therefore we need to be very careful with the internet. Well, I would say that that's, it's not a counter narrative; it's a narrative, right? So we have one here, two of them. Uh, we just briefly uh, touched the topic of 9-11, and if you remember, uh, for example, the events of uh, Moscow 1999, uh, Guryanova, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, the explosions of uh, uh, whatever Lithuanian and Fersinski then called the FSB is yeah. blowing up Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, however, a couple of days ago, in Russian social media, I read uh, a thread or several threads about uh, actually transposing the situation to the Westminster Bridge, uh, Manchester bombing, and uh, of course London Bridge. Mm -hmm. That uh, the main idea behind it is that uh, it's a conspiracy theory, of course, uh, orchestrated by Theresa May uh, in order to win the elections mm -hmm. because she's losing. Um, the gap is narrow between the Labour Party and the Conservatives. Do you think that this argument will ever hold validity? Will what? Will hold validity. Right. The argument that Theresa May orchestrated that uh, because it's being actively discussed in Russian social media for the last uh, 48 hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the Russian. Put this one to bed right now. <laughs> <laughs> is it true? <laughs> Should I be controversial? <laughs> Should I try this counter narrative? Uh, I mean, um, in a way, it's a, it's very representative of how uh, kind of currently Russian uh, citizens are reacting and how they are consuming information. So, kind of the issue of transparency or non-transparency of of uh, power of last year, right? Of these power institutions, uh, it's actually one of the reasons why conspiracy theories proliferate all across the world. But in the Russian case, it's certainly there is a there is a trauma of uh, for some for, again for some communities uh, because uh, the major I'm not sure that the majority of people actually uh, is interested in uh, kind of in these events which happened in 1999 or even events in 19 2002 or 2004 in Dubrovka or during the siege of the school in Beslan, uh, Russian population, kind of the, a large part of it, quite quickly forgets. And we can check, the, for example, the op opinion polls. But certainly for a certain part of the population, especially those are very critical of the Kremlin, the idea that the, the bombings of the, of the buildings in 1999 were carried out by the FSB, uh, this is a very important, uh, for me, it's a very important way of understanding how these particular communities think and perceive uh, political developments in the country. Because for them, this is actually kind of the, the sign of powerlessness. They cannot really uh, change what's going on in Russian politics today. They understand that the power is in the hands of, the say, in that sense, FSB and KGB and the Kremlin, and they cannot do anything with that. That's why they kind of, by spreading conspiracy theories, they try to delegitimize FSB, KGB, whatever you call the Kremlin, and argue that well, the power uh, is in the hands of the small clan that carried out conspiracy against the Russian people. And that's why it has kind of certain negative uh, consequences for uh, the people of Russia. I mean, this is how this certain uh, group of people who share this notion uh, perceive uh, politics, in my point of view. But then again, uh, given that 
kind of the I mean, Russian media are keen on uh, spreading various kinds of conspiracy theories about the West, about the Western politicians, criticizing them. I think uh, it, 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 it's quite plausible that you know somebody, again, some interesting processes in the grassroots in that case, because social media provide a very a, a good, like a, a very virtual ground for, uh, for kind of for the emergence of these grassroots thinkers. And we can see that YouTube, for example, on YouTube, um, I forget the name of the guy, Vyacheslav, maybe some of my Russian colleagues can help me. There's a guy who was actually running to the Duma as a, as a second number in the Parnas uh, party. And he is one of those, uh, for, unfortunately, not Nemtsev. Vyacheslav Nemtsev? Maltsev. 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 Who is a, a very clear example of a grassroots conspiracy theorist who became popular because of his video blog. And then he's like, he um, transformed from this video blogger to the number two in the, in the party list, which is also quite an interesting process that we can observe currently in, uh, in the Russian uh, environment. So we've got two questions. Should, should we take these together? Yeah. Yep. So I'll start with the um, back. So I to just briefly um, challenge on Richard Evans said and then kind of link that into a question. So he was kind of saying it didn't make sense due to suggest that conspiracy theories weren't necessarily negative. Mm -hmm. so I think it's certainly true that conspiracy theorists are particularly resistant to evidence or kind of tend to lack in benevolence. And so I think Richard Evans' argument worked in something like America where there is lots of evidence or here, you know, and you can more categorically say if that's right or wrong. But it strikes me that the interesting context of Russia is it's just hard to know what's true or not. You know, you, you can be particularly resistant to evidence that the state might put forward or certain organizations might put forward, or you can lack evidence, but that's because it's just very hard to know what's true. Um, so, and of course, you know, sometimes there are conspiracies. So my question is that, you know, Putin and oligarchs have actively engaged in conspiracies, I mean, you know, killing opponents, these sorts of things. But how do, is there a way that the mainstream media can cover that if they do start to kind of step up and be more ethical? Mm -hmm. that kind of becoming conspiracy theorists themselves? Or do you just end up with one conspiracy theory versus another conspiracy theory and nobody just knows what they can do? Well, the book is totally different. Uh, uh, no, okay, well, why well, don't well, you take that question first? Then. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, my understanding uh, of kind of working and um, exploring the Russian media environment, Russian media kind of like journalistic community, is that uh, if Let's say, if imagine that kind of uh, there was a freedom of speech and the and media could be owned by various independent, let's say, businessmen or journalistic uh, communities, for example, right? Uh, I would say that um, there will be some positive um, uh, developments. And for example, if the journalists are going to start investigating certain kind of events in the history of post-Soviet Russia, such as the 99 bombings, for example, right? There might be uh, the case that these conspiracy theories on which certain groups of Russian population are keen on will be proved as real conspiracies. I mean, then it's going to become criminal uh, cases against those who basically uh, carry them on, right? Uh, at the moment, certainly, it's impossible because uh, the media environment, as I said, is controlled by the state or by the state um, loyal oligarchs. I know if I uh, answered your question. Yeah. So you say that the role of Russian media and sort of RT, Sputnik, and all the international outlets that are directed by Moscow is trying to undermine the credibility of the West. So I was wondering how does that fit uh, the fact, for instance, Macron didn't allow RT or Sputnik into their headquarters. Is that fueling the conspiracy theories or is that actually fighting against them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, it's, it's really hard to say because I don't speak French, so I couldn't really explore what, was, uh, what kind of narratives RT, and I think RT has a French outlet. If I if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. yes. At least Sputnik. So I don't know what kind of narrative this um, media was spreading in French elections, but there was certainly uh, a concern among uh, Western European and American elites that the Russian media are very efficient in that sense in undermining the reputation of uh, those politicians who are kind of who are meant to win. But then the case of. Hillary Clinton and the way how the whole story is framed uh, nowadays. It's like it points and basically helps to kind of to, to justify this very anti-RT, anti-Russian propaganda um, narratives stronger. 
So, I mean, what Macron did, again, I cannot really comment on that because I'm not really aware of the situation in France. But I would say it's, it's, it was kind of one of those proactive measures uh, which kind of became uh, popular in a way in the wake of the um, elections of Trump. Yes, uh, you speak of uh, RT as a kind of a single line of the propaganda. How would you assess the changes in RT pre-Trump and post-Trump? Have, have there been any changes? Uh, I, would say, I would say that RT uh, has been fairly uncritical of Trump. Yeah. But then again, RT was never kind of at least what I again, I did not do uh, any particular research on how RT covered Trump, so I can only say it's from the point of view of just uh, kind of a, uh, a viewer. Uh, in general, Russian media were very positive about Trump, and RT was trying not to Trump for <coughs> Trump, let's put it like that, no. but rather was trying to degrade and destroy the reputation of Hillary Clinton, yes. which would actually help uh, kind of Trump to get a slightly more support. And so kind of the general narrative is now is to be slightly more uh, balanced or rather even negative towards the elites. But now it would be re really curious to see how RT is going to be uh, changing its, its coverage of American politics. I would be keen to look at that. Okay. Can I ask a sure. Uh, so you took Talk a lot about the sort of political pressures on journalists and how these kind of very subtly shape the kind of choices they make and so on. Um, but I wonder, could you say a bit more about the commercial pressures that they're under? Because you mm -hmm. talked, you talked about uh, not letting the facts get in the way of a good story. Mm -hmm. This, you know, this doesn't look like a dull um, state-owned broadcaster sort of pumping out news. So I, I wondered if you could give us more of a sense of like what sorts of choices and what sorts of options do the viewers have here and what. What are the kind of economic imperatives behind this? Because one of the things that drives conspiracy narratives a lot in the West is low journalistic quality because they need clicks. Mm -hmm. Because that's what drives, you know, that's what sells. And the good stuff yeah. has, a, has a small market. So what kind of role do market imperatives play in this story as opposed to simply political direction? Well, that's, that, that's a very good question. Uh, in terms of finances, for example, if you are talking about RT, it doesn't really depend on, on advertisement. It is state funded. But if you're talking about the uh, um, state-aligned media outlets, for example, television channels, they certainly depend on advertisements. And we see that there are kind of programs which attract more, uh, uh, more attention, more viewers, such as, for example, uh, Dmitry Kisilov's program was uh, at some point the most popular news program on the Russian TV, and certainly the time of uh, kind of the time each second of the advertisement costs quite a lot and I think that to a certain extent financially these media outlets maybe they are not necessarily profitable but I think they will be driving quite a lot of cash but at the same time for example some of the programs on the channels like RENTV which are not mainstream like they are not covering all the territory of Russian Federation because I mean again Russian Federation is huge and there are only few channels which cover it by the means of its uh, technical capabilities, like first channel and, and state from channel Russia. Uh, but then, for example, Rentavers programs such as um, um, uh, the Military Secret, it's called Military Secret, Vayana Taina. Uh, it is one of the most popular programs on, on this channel, and it drives, as far as I know, according to the inside, it drives quite a lot of cash. And it is profitable. And, and in that sense, the Russian media environment and media, kind of the principles of work, change quite a lot, uh, differ quite a lot from the situation, for example, in, uh, the, in the UK or in the US, where the quality journalism costs a lot. But then on the other hand, tabloid journalism here is it's quite a popular stuff, right? Which doesn't really differ a lot from, let's say, these Russian programs that talk about aliens, talk about the conspiracy of CIA against Russia, etc. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the Macron point, if I could, actually, mm -hmm. because what, um, what RT and Sputnik try to do, they try to, they try to start a smear campaign on Macron. Mm -hmm. um, when he's, when, at, 
at the moment when he started becoming the lead kind of candidate, mm -hmm. and Russia all of a sudden no longer could back either Marine Le Pen or Putin or or Fillon, who were both two, two pro Putin candidates. And what they tried to say was that there was a gay Jewish cabal that was supporting Macron. Um, and their reference for this was one um, kind of slightly dubious right wing politician who had lost his position. And I think, and so, and then actually, by the way, this completely backfired. The other thing they tried to say, so they, this was their line of attack, so the Jewish cabal, Macron is close to Hillary Clinton, and WikiLeaks has something on Macron that's going to be released. It's backfired because Macron's team just came in and said, look, this is, we've seen this before, this is exactly what happened in America. We know that what Russia tried to do in terms of, um, in terms of Hillary Clinton, so don't be fooled, and the people weren't fooled. But I think what's interesting about that case is to try to distinguish, to go back to the discussion we'll be having about um, the difference between conspiracy theories and politics. Because you might say there are political facts that back up this claim, which is to say, yes, the media were behind Macron, or certain parts of the French media were behind Macron. I mean, there's nothing surprising about that. Nobody's up in arms of the fact that the Daily Mail supports Theresa May here, right? That's just politics. Again, um, the gay cabal, I mean, so yes, um, on the one hand, obviously, some of the French media is owned by Jewish. Um, it's just one certain Draghi, there's a certain guy who owns a certain type of um, French media. And on the other hand, the claim was made is because Yves Saint Laurent's partner had supported Macron. So clearly, there was this gay Jewish cabal behind Macron. Okay. But so here you, but here, you, here you can tell the difference. But it's an interesting case study in trying to parse out what's the difference between politics and conspiracy theory. I mean, politics, oh, it's natural that certain people support certain candidates, right? Uh -huh. That's just politics. But then you have to go one step further to uh -huh. say this is actually a conspiracy, that there is actually a conspiracy of the Jews, of the media, etc. And incidentally, unsurprisingly, it's always the same kind of, it's always the same groups of people who are uh -huh. part of this conspiracy. So there is a difference between saying this is political influence, which is more, I think, what people like Donhoff and Foucault are talking about, they're not talking about conspiracy theories, because if you talk about conspiracy theories, you have to say, it's not just that there's influence, it's also that there's a small group of people who come together and they rule the whole world. That's when you get a full-blown conspiracy. That's when you get the call about a Jewish cabal. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between a Jewish cabal and having Jewish media support for this. Mm -hmm. And that's the space within which you tell the difference between politics and conspiracy theories, and I think it's important to Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. Theory. Well, that's why we need to kind of always keep in mind those elements which I named, kind of about the secret group, Jewish, gay, cabal, whatever, which has all the power, and that's why it kind of pushes uh, for, for Macron, etc. So that's why we always need to keep these kind of ideas and these elements in mind in order to kind of analyze politics, no matter what. Okay, so this is now half six, so um, I propose that we can carry on the conversation outside here with a glass of wine, and I'd just like to give a big thank you to Ilya Yablokov for a very stimulating talk.